This is my Ducati Scrambler. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Hello! This little irritating son of a bitch is mine. It is a Ducati Scrambler. It is new for me this year, and uh, it's been a mixed bag of a bike, to be honest. I want to say that I love it. I think I almost do, but sometimes I have to sort of force myself or remind myself that I do like it as much as I do. Having said that, when I am away from it, I haven't ridden it in a few days, I do find myself getting the itch to uh, swing a leg back over it and go out for a ride. So there must be something at least that draws me to it, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Before I get onto the reliability of this, uh, some of the customization, although not a lot, let's start with the boring stuff, the specifications. If you are looking at buying one of these things, you might be interested to know what sort of power it develops and what sort of performance you might get from it. So let's start, as you always should, with the engine. This is a Ducati engine, which means that it is an L-twin. For the most part, that's what they deal in. And they do it very well. They've been doing it for many years. And it's not a particularly new engine, this one in particular, actually, even over the Monsters. And I would say this is similar to a Ducati Monster, but more similar to the older Ducati Monsters than it is to the newer ones, which is slightly more efficient, slightly more modern. You have a capacity of just over 800 cc's, you have a horsepower of around 73 and 66 newton meters of torque. Found at either 5,700 revs for the torque or 8,200 for the horsepower. I still generally play around 5,000 revs and I might take it up to about 7,000 maybe, but it really does start to get a little bit vibey up towards that end of the spectrum. I do tend to leave it sat around 4,000. If you sat on the motorway, you're doing, I think it's around five and a half, actually. That's where it starts to feel a bit strained, doing 70 miles an hour. Nought to 60, I think, of around five seconds-ish. Fast enough that it doesn't feel dull. Slow enough that if you're new to it, or you're in, you know, in the early days of your riding experience it's um, not going to scare you at all you could crack that throttle wide open and it wouldn't even scare an inexperienced rider or a novice this is the kind of road I'd want to be taking it on narrow twisty somewhere you can get a good lean on it it doesn't need to be perfect conditions either and it's absolutely fine because it's really forgiving it's not scary or unmanageable You've also got Kayaba suspension, front and back, non-adjustable on the front, preload adjustability only on the rear. It's pretty basic, but decent enough. I'd also probably say it's a little bit on the softer side, but then being a scrambler, you would expect that over a dedicated street bike, let's say. You've got pretty basic brakes as well. So you have Brembo's front and back. You have a four piston Brembo caliper as well. And that thing is beefy. It's huge. Decent braking power from a single disc actually, but the fact that it is lightweight definitely helps with that. And then the single pot Brembo on the back is still decent enough as well. And I think you can turn off ABS on the rear. Let me try that now actually. I'm just gonna have a little play. Let's go for it. Ooh, ooh, you can turn ABS off. There you go. And then the ABS will flash. That tells you the ABS is off, which means that you can take this off road and skid out the rear and look really cool. It's a pretty short bike as well. You've got a seat height of around 798 millimeters, I believe, or just under 800. And it's a really comfortable low seat height for beginners, for shorter riders. That obviously comes in. It's a favorite with beginner riders because of that as well. And the other thing that's massively in its favor for new riders or people who aren't quite as confident is it's hugely light as well. It's 173 kilograms, I think. Let's say 175 dry so just under about 190 with a full tank the tank is quite small but that means that it feels nice and manageable nice and flickable and it's not an intimidating weight at all even if you're just moving it around parked and then there's the bars now i've changed them for a reason it does feel better it's easier to get through traffic it feels better when you're on road which is the majority of what you'll do but they're high enough that it's not a strain it doesn't batter your neck or your shoulders and they're narrow enough as well so it's comfortable, it gives you the right amount of leverage as well, so you can change direction pretty quickly. And I just prefer them. The position's pretty comfortable. I would say if you're on the road for 
more than an hour and a half, definitely in a straight line as opposed to going around corners where you're shifting a bit more. You will start to feel it, but it's a pretty soft, pretty comfortable seat. Gearbox is pretty smooth as well, actually. I did, when I first got it, get one or two false neutrals, which annoyed me, but you just have to change gear with a little more purpose, and that does go away. I don't think I've had any for the last two, three months or so. And then if you were looking to pick one up for yourself, for something like this, this is 2015 when they first came out, it had decent kind of mileage on it as well. You're paying between 4,000 and 5,000 pounds, let's say, depending on the quality of the one you're looking at. If you want a new one, they are around 8,000 pounds. That depends on the model or version that you go for, and that'll be for the 800cc versions as opposed to the 1100. That's where this well-known Ducati tax comes into play. It is slightly more expensive, arguably, than it is worth. But if you want one, then it's worth whatever you're willing to pay. So the mileage is, it's got a little tiny tank, uh, but it'll give you about 100 miles if you're doing town stuff, depending on how you ride. But if it's slower stuff, probably about 100, then the reserve will come on, and then I don't really want to guess how much the reserve is. But I know that uh, taking it on a motorway, I think I got about 130. The light came on at about 115 and did another 15 before I got to a petrol station and it wasn't overly concerning. I'm going to assume you could probably get about 20 miles out of that reserve, but I wouldn't want to test it myself. And if you only do road riding, change the tyres, you'll get a better life out of them. But if you're doing a mix, obviously keep both on there. Or if you just like the look and you want to keep them on, then they handle absolutely fine. They're surprisingly good, actually, in that they have surprised me with how good they are. But it is true when people say that you will burn through them quickly. It doesn't really matter what kind of riding you're doing either, it's just gonna wear through pretty quick. That leads us quite nicely onto the different versions that you will find. If we start with the modern Ducati Scrambler from 2015, they came out with a few different versions. They had a 400cc version, which was a great little starter bike. If you're in the UK, it's fantastic as an A2 friendly or ready bike good to go but obviously slightly smaller than this then you have the 800 versions which are pretty much exactly the same they are just different skins on the same kind of frame same kind of model really so you have the classic which has the spoke wheels and the aluminium fenders you have the icon which is the one that i've got which has the cast wheels and it's probably the most neutral in its styling. Then you've got the Urban Enduro, which is made to look like something which is more capable at going off-road, but realistically it's exactly the same as this one. And then you've got the Full Throttle as well, which came with a lovely Termagoni exhaust. Those versions are all scramblers in name alone. You can take them off-road. This one you could take off-road feasibly, but you're gonna be doing some real mild off-roading. If you want the proper off-roading version, then you go for the Desert Sled, which came out in 2017. I think, I think, I haven't ridden it myself, but I believe it's slightly better. Along with that version, they did update all of their other lineup as well, and they brought in the Cafe Racer. It wouldn't be my choice. It does look quite nice, but if you're gonna get a Scrambler, it just seems strange. It's a bit of an oxymoron to call something a Ducati Scrambler Cafe Racer, because you cannot scramble on a Cafe Racer. No, actually, let me change that. You can scramble on a cafe racer, you just wouldn't want to. And then in 2018, they brought out the 1100 versions, which are obviously just slightly bigger than this, more powerful as well. Faults, this will be a fun one. <laughs> it's Italian. I'm gonna assume you know the next words out of my mouth. Say it with me, people. Electronics, for God's sake. I cannot be that unlucky, I know, I know. I've put that in other videos as well. And I got comments saying I must just be buying bad versions of those bikes, that it's my fault somehow. Yeah, sure, I'll go with that so far, apart from the fact that the V7 that I bought, which had minor, minor electronic faults, was a 2016 with 2,000 miles on it, as new, practically. This one was a 2015 with 6,000 miles on it, and it lived in a garage for all of its life. It was well kept and well surfaced. So you tell me what the common thread is there. Sort it out, because I'm getting sick and tired of talking about it. I don't want to complain about electronics from Italian manufacturing, but here we are. Honestly, I will take into account that it may well be this 
Ducati Scrambler, and only this Ducati Scrambler, but when I took it to the garage and he actually figured out what the fault was, he did say that it was recognized, or at least it was talked about as a fault, with the starter switch. But let me paint you a picture of this thing breaking down for me and damn near killing me. Zero exaggeration. I really am not exaggerating about that at all. Because I was riding home from London. It was nighttime. It was raining. There was no hard shoulder. I was in the third lane and overtaking at the time because this gave me no kind of a warning or indication that something was wrong. And then it just decided to cut completely out on me. Died, stone dead. Um, and then I had to sort of just coast off to the side. And honestly, I was about two foot from the off ramp. So I was so close to safety, but not quite. And I just ended up slowing down and slowing down and slowing down. And the cars behind me were beeping because obviously I was doing it for fun and not because the bike was just throwing in its hand. And I managed to roll it off at least and sit there. And I had to sit there for about 40 seconds or something like that before eventually trying it again, it did uh, kick over. So I, I wrote it home, it cut out on me about five more times on the way home. And then one morning it wouldn't start at all, which obviously means something electronic is failing. And my guess was something with the starter switch, which I'm told is not uncommon. It's not ridiculously common on them either, but I think it was something, it's gotta to be to do with the kill switch just cutting out the engine. So there's a short in there somewhere, but we've changed it and it hasn't had any problems since. The rest of it has been pretty reliable for me at least. I haven't had anything else major go wrong with it but if you're looking for other faults one of them is the oh the sensor in the side stand actually which again i haven't had a problem with mine but certain um versions of this had a problem with that and i think they did a recall on them actually uh, but again if you find that that's going to cut out the engine because it's a safety feature and then if it cuts it out on you in the wrong moment then that's going to be a problem obviously another thing with a few of them and only a small kind of batch uh, from the factory is that the clutch was tightened uh, too much. They didn't leave any kind of plate in it, which meant that it was slipping the clutch to a certain degree and would wear out the clutch quicker than it should. Uh, but as long as you check over your own bike and you're familiar with that, just leave a little bit of play with the clutch lever, then you'll be absolutely fine. Honestly though, even though it uh, burned a pretty substantial bridge early on, since that point we've been getting on fine and it has been very reliable for me. I've got no kinds of uh, problems with it and it is a basic motor. One of the huge pluses, one of the reasons I went for this is because it is so simple, you feel like you could do a certain amount on it yourself. So if anything was to go wrong, you can uh, get access to most of it actually and you would have the knowledge or at least be able to find the knowledge to fix certain things. Saying that, obviously it's a Ducati. If you are gonna do anything more extreme, uh, you will wanna take it to a dealership and Ducati is one of those brands that you just wanna stay on top of the servicing for. What I will say about that is that they are a little bit more expensive as well because it is Ducati, uh, especially with the Desno service, which you won't want to skip at all. And that will devalue your bike to a certain degree if you don't do it. Now, I also wanted to own it for a long while, so I got the value out of it. I didn't have to keep changing bikes as I tend to do, but I'm sure you'll see me in six months time and I'll have something completely different to this. But if you want to know what I've changed on mine, first, we'll start with the bars. I wanted to go for these Renthals with the crossbar. Uh, I did, but that also meant that I would have to change the clock. The cables are a big thing. Didn't anticipate that actually, but there is so much cable that it just bunches up in a weird kind of way and you have to find interesting ways to wrap it around the headstock to uh, make it less conspicuous. In doing that, I needed to change the clock uh, and get the, and I didn't want to have to do it, but I got the Rizoma mount so it's centrally mounted on the back as opposed to that uh, off-center front mount. Uh, and I do like that, it's just that I didn't really want to spend that money, uh, although it's not too expensive really. The problem with that, if you buy this, is that you will need a one inch bar um, or some, what do they call them, shims, uh, to fit a seven eighths bar, which is the one that I've actually got on here for the rentals. I also had the bright idea of sticking this high sider mirror. I love their stuff actually, it's a great mirror. And I like the under mount position. Uh, and actually you can see a decent amount as long as you're not wearing a backpack or you don't have a passenger, but solo you can see loads around yourself and even so much on the other side as well. Uh, what else have we got on the front there? I changed or at least put on the, um, the headlight uh, guard. You've got a bash guard, which is uh, just from Ducati um, and actually came on the bike. I changed the exhaust, which I'll show you in a second. That is a MIV uh, double gun, I think it's called. 
uh, but it's a MIV exhaust anyway, and to my eye at least, it looks a lot better than the other options that you can go for. A lot of them just look like uh, you've <laughs> welded a baked bean can on the end of the exhaust. And then the big one, new one for me, these SW Motec panniers. Let me grab one. Absolute game changer because I hate wearing a backpack and that was one of the other things I wanted from this is to be able to do some luggage and it clips in like that and it's as secure as you like. It is waterproof. They suit the general aesthetic of the bike. They do other options as well. And the actual mounts themselves aren't too big or ugly. They fit the other lines of the bike, which is quite nice. So let's fire it up and you can actually listen to it. So if I was reviewing this bike to live with, I have to kind of split it into three. So to begin with the city stuff, it works okay. But one of the big things for me is the throttle control of it. It's so on off, it becomes really tedious to ride in a city for a long time at least. Then there's the fact that if you're riding through the wet, it's got no kind of uh, weather protection on it. And it's just not a nice place to sit in the winter. If you're riding this thing in colder temperatures, the fact that you are so padded up to the nines and dressed like the Michelin man is jarringly stark as a contrast to how small this bike is. It feels like you're on a BMX wrapped up in a sleeping blanket and it's really odd and unpleasant to ride through colder, wetter temperatures. Not that any bike is particularly enjoyable, but I really didn't like my time on this in the cold and wet. Then you've got the faster stuff. So if you get the chance to take it out in the sweeping bends in the country on some A roads and B roads, it has a very specific application. On B roads, on tighter, twistier stuff, kind of gnarly stuff, it's a really forgiving bike. It gives a lot of feedback. You know exactly where you're at with it. If you were to take it out on some faster stuff, some more open stuff, much more sweeping bends, then it is, however, gonna start to feel a little bit underpowered. It's gonna start to run out of puff if you're riding with other bikes, that's going to be more noticeable. And then there's the off-road. It is called a scrambler. If you were to take it off-road, and I have to admit, I don't do an awful lot of it, but even with my limited knowledge, I know that the pegs for a start are quite slippy. You would want to change them. If you stand up on them, you will feel yourself at least shifting around them, and you could slip off. The bars, obviously, I have changed. The stock ones are absolutely fine, actually. They would work pretty well for off-road. The position you're in is quite good. But then the suspension hasn't got the longest travel. It's really not made for anything too extreme. And it's got pretty limited ground clearance if you were to take it off. And all of that delicate Italian underbelly is exposed unless you put that uh, bash guard on the bottom. And then the big and most obvious point is the fact that the throttle control is not precise at all. So if you are taking it off-road, it's got a decent amount of engine braking as well. So when you're on off with the throttle, as I mentioned previously, if you are on with the throttle, it's going to throw you back into the seat. If you hit an errant bump, it's just going to throw you back. If you roll off too quickly, then you're going to get engine braking and start to drift over the front of the bars. And that's not an enjoyable experience either. So you would have to feather the clutch and that just makes it a little bit harder to work with off-road. Now I wanted to use it or buy a bike that suited the majority of my riding, which is the, like I say, more town stuff, city stuff. So the lower speed stuff, something that's nimble and punchy and just great fun to ride around like that. And uh, it is to a certain degree, but honestly the throttle is the big deal breaker for me and the clutch engagement as well. It's just not smooth. But I do like the fact that it is uh, very, very simple. I love the fact that it reminds me of the Ducati Monsters that I am familiar with. Uh, it has been reliable. and I thought it would be more reliable than it is or has been to me at least, with it, the exception of that first month of ownership where it just let itself down. You let yourself down, all right? But even having said that, I do obviously enjoy it. I love when I'm actually sat on it and I remember why it's fun to ride. And I'm sure if I get it in exactly the right setting, and I think that's the big thing, is that although this is, or is supposed to have quite a broad application, it's not a specialist, but it's great in lots of different scenarios. I think in actual fact, it's a little bit too specialist because if you want to get the most out of it, it's a very specific set of circumstances that will let you enjoy it to its fullest. And I think realistically, it's gonna be most enjoyable on some really tight, kind of complex B roads where it is so nimble, so agile, and so old school that it just becomes charming. Now, the crucial thing is if you were comparing this to the V7 
from Motogutsi or a Triumph Bonneville 900, any of them really, take your pick. If the question was, which one is the most modern feeling, that would be the Bonneville. Which one is the smoothest and easiest to live with, that would be the Bonneville. Which one is the quickest, it's between this and the Bonneville, but maybe this. Which one would I want to take off-road out of the Street Scrambler from Triumph? Or the Ducati Scrambler, I think I'd probably want to take the Ducati off-road. But if you want some old-school charm, it's between the Ducati Scrambler or the Motogutsi V7. Now I have a soft spot in my heart for the V7 and I would choose the V7. I couldn't necessarily tell you why, but it was a little bit easier to live with. This one feels maybe a little bit more playful. It feels a bit more like you can, uh, I don't want to say take the piss with it, but it'll forgive you for wringing its neck, whereas the V7 is a gentleman's ride. You don't want to ride that like a hooligan. I feel like when you pull up with the V7, if you have been wringing its neck, you just feel a bit ashamed of yourself. <laughs> you feel like you're being abusive. Whereas this one still has a wagging tail at the end of it. And if you're new to biking, it's great. This is unintimidating. It's easy to get on with. And even if it has some faults, those faults will teach you a certain amount that you'll need to learn, unfortunately. You don't necessarily get as much with new bikes. You kind of need it occasionally to break down on you in certain ways. It's never fun, but it's just a part of biking, honestly. For most bikes, anyway. And then it's just unintimidating. You get it on a road like that, and you can drop it down to the pegs, and you would feel like it has grip. You know exactly what it is doing beneath you. It's very visceral, you can feel all of the feedback. And if you've been riding for a while and you want a second bike that's relatively cheap, pick one up for £4,000, that's a great little second bike for sunny Sunday rides like this, nothing too serious. I wouldn't personally use it or recommend it as a commuter. I wouldn't recommend it if you want to do a lot of off-road. But if you're going to do little tiny bits of each, then fine, go for it. But you pays your money, you takes your choice, if you want one, you want one, just go into it with your eyes open and enjoy it for what it is, on the right day. Yeah.